Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Tara, Jamie, Lily, Chloe, and Bella. It's always a reminder to please stay safe, healthy, hit that like button, subscribe, and comment below. And today we're going to get back into Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. And without further ado, let's just get there. Thank you. All right, we are back on Stevie King's Pet Cemetery. We are on chapter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Forty-six. After he and Rachel were done talking, Judd put on his light coat. The day had clouded up, and the wind had begun to blow up, to blow, and cross the road to Lewis's house. Pausing on his side of the road to look carefully for trucks before crossing. It was the trucks that had been the cause of all this, the damn trucks. Except it wasn't. He could feel the pet cemetery pulling at him. And something beyond. Where once its voice had been a kind of seductive lullaby. The voice of uh, possible comfort and a dreamy sort of power. It was now lower and more than ominous. With threatening, it was threatening and grim. Stay out of this, you. But he would not stay out of it. His responsibility went back too far. He saw that Lewis's Honda Civic was gone from the garage. There was only the big Ford wagon looking dusty and unused. He tried the back door of the house and found it open. Lewis, he called, knowing that Lewis was not going to answer, but needing to cut across the heavy silence of this house somehow. Oh... Not this lighting messing up. Oh, getting old was starting to be a pain in the ass. His limbs felt heavy and clumsy most of the time. His back was a misery to him. After a mere two hours in the garden, it felt as if there were a screw auger pillined in his left hip. He began to go through the house, methodically looking for signs he had to look for. World's oldest housebreaker, he thought, without much humor, and went right on looking. He found none of the things that would have seriously set him. Boxes of toys held back from the Salvation Army. Clothes for a small boy put beside, beside, side behind a fence or in the closet or under a bed. Perhaps worst of all, the crib carefully set up and gauged his room again. There were absolutely none of the signs, but the house still had an unpleasant blank feel as if it were waiting to be filled with, well, something. Okay. Perhaps I ought to take a little run out on Pleasantville Cemetery, see if every, anything's doing out there. Might even run into Lewis Creed. I could buy him a dinner or something, but it wasn't at Pleasant View Cemetery in Bangor that there was danger. The danger was here in this house and beyond it. Judd left again and crossed the road to his own house. He pulled a six-pack of beer out of the kitchen fridge and took it into the living room. He sat down in front of the bay window that looked out in the Creed house. Cracked a beer and lit a cigarette. The afternoon drew down around him, and as it did so often these last few years, he would find his mind turning back and back in a widening gyre. If he had known the run of Rachel Creed's earlier thoughts, he could have told her that her psych teacher had told what that what her psych teacher had told her was maybe the truth. But when you got older, that dimming function of the memory broke down little by little. The same way that everything else in your body broke down and you found yourself recalling places and faces and events with an eerie surety. Sepia-toned memory, memories grew bright again, the colors truing up. The voices losing that tinny ed echo of time and regaining their original resonance. It wasn't informational breakdowns at all. Judd could have told him. The name for, for it was senility. In his mind, Judd again saw Les Lester Morgan's bull handwriting. His eyes rimming with, rimmed with red, charging at everything in sight, everything that moved, charging at trees when the wind jigged the leaves. Before Lester gave up and called it off, every tree in Hanratty's fence meadow was gored with his brainless fury, and his horns were split, splintered, and his head was bleeding. When Lester put Hanratty down, Lester had been sick with dread, the way Judd himself was right now. He drank beer and smoked. Daylight faded. He did not put on the light. Gradually, the tip of his cigarette became a small red pip. 
in the darkness. He sat and drank beer and watched Lewis Creed's driveway. He believed that when Lewis came home from wherever he was, he would go over and have a little talk with him, make sure Lewis wasn't planning to do anything he shouldn't. And still he felt the soft tug of whatever it was, whatever sick power it was that inhabited that devil's place reaching down from its bluff of rotted stone where all those carns had been built. Stay out of this, you. Stay out of it, or you're going to be very, very sorry. Ignoring it as best he could, Judd sat and smoked and drank beer and waited. Chapter 47 <clears throat> There we are. While Judd Crandall was sitting in the ladder back rocker and watching for him out of his bay window, Lewis was eating a big tasteless dinner in the Howard Johnson's dining room. The food was plentiful and dull, exactly what his body seemed bit warm. Outside it had grown dark. The headlights of the passing cars probed like fingers. He shoveled the food in, a steak, a baked potato, a side dish of beans which were a bright green nature a bright green nature had never intended. A wedge of apple pie with a scoop of ice cream on top of it melting into a soft drool. He ate a corner t at the corner table, watching people come and go, wondering if he might not see someone he knew. In a vague way, he rather hoped that would happen. It would lead to questions where Rachel's what are you doing here? How's it going? And perhaps the questions would lead to complications, and maybe complications were what he really wanted the way out. And that Howard Johnson had uh, actually existed and just closed as one of the last uh, Howard Johnsons, I think, maybe one in the country left, I think, is maybe one more, I'm not sure. But anyways, it just closed like a year or so ago. It was in Bangor. And as a matter of fact, a couple that he didn't no, came in just as he was finishing his apple pie and second cup of coffee. Rob Grinnell, a Bangor doctor, and his pretty white Barbara. He waited for them to see him, sitting here in the corner at his table for one, but the hostess led them, hey sweet pea, to the booths on the far side of the room, and Lewis lost sight of them entirely except for an occasional glimpse of Grinnell's pr prematurely graying hair. The waitress brought Lewis's check. He signed for it, jotting his room number under his signature and left by the side door. Outside, the wind had risen to near gale force. It was a steady, droning presence, making the electrical wires hum oddly. He could see no stars, but had the sense of clouds rushing past overhead at high speed. Lewis stood on the walk for a moment, hands in pockets, full face tilted into that wind. One second. <clears throat> Lewis stood on the walk for a moment, hands in pockets, face tilted into that wind. Then he turned back and went up to his room and turned on the television. It was too early to do anything serious, and that night wind was too full of possibilities. and made him nervous. He watched four hours of TV8 back-to-back half-hour comedy programs. He realized it had been a very long time since he had watched so much TV on a steady, uninterrupted stream. He thought that all the female leads on the sick Combs were what he and his friends called cock teasers. Back in high school in Chicago, Dory Goldman was, was wailing, fly back. Honey, why do you want to fly back? You just got here. In Ludlow, Judd Crandall sat by his bay window, smoking and drinking beer, motionless, <clears throat> examining the mental scrapbook of his own past and waiting for Lewis to come home. Sooner or later, Lewis would come home. <laughs> She's tapping at me. It's because uh, Bella's taking over. In the other room. Sooner or later, Lewis would come home, just like Lassie in that old movie. There were other ways up to the pet cemetery and the place beyond, but Lewis didn't know them. If he intended to do it, he would begin from his own door yard. Unaware of these other happenings, like slow moving projectiles aimed not at where he was, but rather in the best ballistics tradition at the place where he would be, Lewis sat and watched the Hojo color television set. He had never seen any of those programs before, but he had, sweetheart, but he had heard vague rumors of them. A black family, a white family, the little kid was smarter than the rich grown-ups he lived with. A woman who was single, a woman who was married, a woman who was divorced, he watched it all, sitting in the Hojo chair and glancing out every now and then at the blowy night. When the 11 o'clock news came on, he turned the television set off and went out to do what he had decided to do, perhaps, at the very moment he had seen Gage's baseball cap lying in the road full of blood. And coldness was on him again, stronger than ever, but there was something beneath it. An ember of eagerness, or passion, or perhaps lust, 
no matter it warned him against the cold and kept him together in the wind. As he started the Honda's engine, he thought that perhaps Judd was right about the growing power of that place, for surely he felt it around him now, leading and pushing him on, and he wondered, could I stop, could I stop, even if I wanted to? Chapter 48. Okay, Rolls. You want to what? Dory asked again. Rachel, you're upset. A night's sleep. Rachel only shook her head. She could only, not, only, not explain to her mother why she had to go back. The feeling had risen in her the way a wind rises, an early stirring of the grasses. Hardly noticed, and the air begins to move faster and harder, and there is no calm left, and the gusts become hard enough and make eerie screaming noises around the eaves, and they are shaking the house, and you realize that this is something like a hurricane. And if the wind gets much gets much higher, things are going to fall down. It was six o'clock in Chicago, and Bangor, Lewis was just sitting down to his big, tasteless meal. Rachel and Ellie had done no more than pick at their dinners. Rachel kept raising her eyes from her place to find her daughter's dark glance upon her, asking her what she was going to do about whatever trouble Daddy was in, asking her what she was going to do. She waited for the telephone to ring with Judd to call and tell her that Lewis had come home. And once it did ring, she jumped, and Ellie almost spilled her glass of milk. But it was only a lady from Dory's Bridge Club wanting to know if she had gotten home all right. They were having their coffee when Rachel had abruptly tossed down her napkins and said, Daddy, Mom, I'm sorry, but I have to go home. If I can get a plane, I'm going tonight. Her mother and father gaped at her, but Elliot closed her eyes in an adult expression of relief. It would have been funny if not for the waxy, stretched quality of her skin. They did not understand. And Rachel could no more explain than she could have explained how those tiny puffs of wind so faint they can barely stir the tips of short grass can gradually grow in power until they can knock a steel building flat. She did not believe that Elliot heard news news item about the death of Victor Pascoe and filed it away in her subconscious. Rachel, honey. Her father spoke slowly, kindly, the way one might speak to someone in the grip of a transitory but dangerous hysteria. This is all just a reaction to your son's death. You and Ellie are both reacting strongly to that, and who could blame you? But you'll collapse. You'll just collapse if you try to. Rachel did not answer him. She went to the telephone in the hall. I found airlines in the yellow pages, and Dial Delta's number, while Dory stood close by, telling her that they ought to just think about this. Didn't she think they ought to talk about it, perhaps make a list, and beyond her, Ellie stood, her face still dark, but now it was lit. It was enough hope to give Rachel some courage. Delta Airlines, the voice on the other end, said brightly, This is Kim. May I help you? I hope so, Rachel said. It's extremely important that I get from Chicago to Bangor tonight. It's, it's a bit of an emergency, I'm afraid. Can you check the connections for me? Dubiously, <clears throat> yes, ma'am, but this is very short notice. Well, please check, Rachel said, her voice cracking a little. I'll take stand by anything. All right, ma'am, please hold. The line became smoothly silent. Rachel closed her eyes, and after a moment, she felt a cool hand on her arm. She opened her eyes and saw that Ellie had moved next to it. Erwin and Dory stood together, talking quietly and looking at them, the way you look at people you suspect of being lunatics. Rachel thought wearily she must have smiled for Ellie. Don't let them stop you, Mommy, Ellie said in a low voice. Please, no way, big sister, Rachel said, and then winced was what they had called her ever since Gage had been born, but she was no one's big sister anymore, was she? Thank you, Ellie said. It's very important, isn't it? Ellie nodded. Honey, I believe that it is, but you could help me if you could tell me more. Is it just the dream? No, Ellie said. It's it's everything now. It's running all through me now. Can't you feel it, Mommy? Something like a something like a wind? Ellie shot, sighed shakily, but you don't know what it is. You don't remember anything more about your dream. Ellie thought hard and then shook her head reluctantly. Daddy, Church, and Gage. That's all I remember, but I don't remember how they go, go together, Mommy. Rachel hugged her tightly. It will be all right, she said, but the weight on her face, heart did not lessen. Hello, ma'am, the reservations clerk said. Hello, Rachel tightened her grip on both Ellie and the phone. I think I can get you to Bangor, ma'am, but you're going to be getting in very late. That doesn't matter, Rachel said. Do you have a pen? It's complicated. Yes, right here, Rachel said, getting a stub of pencil out of the drawer. She found the back of an envelope to write on. Rachel listened carefully, writing down everything. When the airline clerk finished, Rachel smiled a little, a little and made an O with her thumb, forefinger to show Ellie that it was going to work. 
probably going to work, she amended. Some of the connections looked very, very tight, especially in Boston. Please book it all, Rachel said, and thank you. Kim took Rachel's name and credit card number. Rachel hung up at last, limp but relieved. She looked at her father. Daddy, will you drive me to the airport? Maybe I ought to say no, Goldman said. I think I might have responsibility to put a stop to this craziness. Don't you dare, Ellie cried shrilly. It's not crazy, it's not. Goldman blinked and stepped back at this small but ferocious outburst. Driver, Irwin, Dory said quietly into the silence that followed. Begun to feel nervous, too. I'll feel better if I know Lewis is all right. Goldman stared at his wife and at last turned to Rachel. I'll drive you if it is what you want, he said. I, Rachel, I'll come with you if you want that. Rachel shook her head. Thank you, Daddy, but I got all the last seats. It's as if God saved them for me. Maybe not. Erwin Goldman sighed. At that moment, he looked very old, and it suddenly occurred to Rachel that her father looked just like looked like Judd Cranby. You have time to pack a bag if you want, he said. We can be at the airport in 40 minutes. If I drive the way I used to when your mother and I were first married, find her your tote bag, Dory. Mommy, Ellie said. Rachel turned toward her. Ellie's face was now sheened with light sweat. What, what, honey? Be careful, Mommy, Ellie said. And we're at the end of chapter 48, on to chapter 49. Alrighty. Chapter 49. The trees were only moving shapes against the cloudy sky backlit by the glow from the airport not too far distant. Lewis parked the Honda Mason Street. Mason boarded Pleasant View on its south side. And here the wind was almost strong enough to rip the car door out of it door out of his hand. He had to push hard to shut it. The wind ripped at his pulled out his jacket as he opened Honda's hatch and took out the piece of tarpaulin he had cut and wrapped around his tools. He was in a wing of darkness between two street lights. Light, standing on the curb with the canvas wrapped, bundle cradled in his arms, looking carefully for traffic before crossing to the raw iron fence which marked the boundary of the graveyard. He did not want to be seen at all. If he could help it, not even by someone who would notice him and forget him the next second. Beside him, the branches of an old elm groaned restlessly in the wind, making Lewis think of jack-leg neck-tied parties. God, he was so scared. This wasn't wild work. It was mad work. No traffic on the Mason Street side. The street lamps marched away in perfect white circles, casting spotlights on the sidewalk where during the day after Fairmount Grammar School let out, boys would ride bikes and girls would jump rope and play hopscotch, ever noticing, never noticing the nearby graveyard except perhaps as at Halloween when it would acquire a certain spooky charm. Perhaps they would dare to cross their suburban street and hang a paper skeleton on the raw iron bars of the high fence, giggling at the old jokes. It's the most popular place in town. People are dying to get in. Why is it wrong to laugh in the graveyard? Because everyone who lives there is always in a grave mood. Gage, he muttered. Gage was in there, behind that wrought iron fence, unjustly imprisoned under a blanket of dark earth, and that was no joke. Gotta break you out, Gage, he thought. Gonna break you out, big guy, or die trying. Lewis crossed the street with his heavy bundle in his arms, stepped up on the other curbed, glanced both ways again, and tossed the canvas roll over the fence, and clinked softly at it as it struck the ground on the far side. Dusting his hands, Lewis walked away. He had marked the place in his mind. Even if he forgot, all he really had to do was follow the fence on the inside until he was standing opposite his Civic and he would fall over it. But would the gate be open this late? He walked down Mason Street to the stop sign the wind ch chasing him and whirring his heels. Moving shadows danced and twined on the roadway. He turned the corner onto Pleasant Street, still following the fence. Car headlights splashed up the street, and Lewis stepped casually behind an, an elm tree. It wasn't a cop car, he saw, only a van moving toward Hammond Street and probably the turnpike. When it was well past him, Lewis walked on. Of course it will be unlocked. It's got to be. He reached the gate, which formed a cathedral shape in raw iron, slim and graceful in the moving wind shadows thrown by the street lights. He reached out and tried it. Locked. You stupid fool. Of course it's locked. <clears throat> Did you really think anyone would have a slew cemetery inside the municipal city limits of any American city unlocked after 11 o'clock? No one is that trusting, dear man. Not anymore. So what do you do now? Now he would have to climb and just hope no one happened to glance away 
the Carson show long enough to see him monkeying up the wrought iron like the world's oldest, slowest kid. Hey, please, I just saw the world's oldest, slowest kid climbing into Pleasant View Cemetery. Looking, looked like he was dying to get in. Yeah, it looked like a grave matter to me. Kidding, oh no, I'm in dead earnest. Maybe you ought to dig into it. Lewis continued up Pleasant Street and turned right up the next intersection. The high iron fence marched along beside him restlessly. The wind cooled and evaporated the drops of sweat on his forehead. And in the hollows of his temples... His shadow waxed and waned in the street lights. Every now and then he glanced in the fence at the fence and then he stopped and forced himself to really look at it. You're going to climb that baby, don't make me laugh. Lewis Creed was a fairly tall man, standing a bit over six too, but the fence was easily nine feet high. Each wrought iron stave ending in a decorative arrow like point. Decorative that is until you happen to slip while swinging your leg over in the force of your, sudden, of your suddenly dropping 200 pounds, drove one of those arrow points into your groin, exploding your testicles. Whoa. And there you would be skewered like a pig at a barbecue, hollering until someone called the police, came and pulled you off and took you to the hospital. The sweat continued to flow, continuing, sticking his shirt to his back. All was silent except the faint hum of late traffic in the Hammond Street. There had to be a way to get in there, had to be. Come on, Lewis, face the facts. You may be crazy, but you're not that crazy. Maybe you could shinny up to the top of that fence, but it would take a trained gymnast to swing over those points without sticking himself on them. And even supposing you can get in, how are you going to get yourself and gauge his body out? He went on walking va vaguely where they were circling the cemetery, but not doing anything constructive. All right, here's the answer. I'll just go on home to Ludlow tonight and come back tomorrow in the late afternoon. I'll go in through the gate. Now, at 4 o'clock, and find a place to hold up until it's midnight. For a little later, I will, in other words, put off until tomorrow what I should have been smart enough to think of today. Good idea, old great swami Lewis. And in the meantime, what do I do about the great big bundle of stuff I threw at the wall? Pick, shovel, flashlight, you might as well stamp grave robbing equipment on every damn piece of it. It land in the bushes. Who's going to find it, for Christ's sake? Oh, on measure, that made sense, but this was no sensible errand he was on. His heart told him quietly... And absolutely that he couldn't come back tomorrow. If he didn't do it tonight, he would never do it. He would never be able to screw himself up to this point. Up to this crazy pitch again. This was the moment, the only time for it he was ever going to have. There was fewer houses up to this way. An occasional square of yellow light gleamed on the other side of the street. And once he saw the gray blue flicker of a black and white TV. And looking through the fence, he saw that the graves were older here. More rounded, sometimes leaning forward or backward with the freezes and thaws of many seasons. There was another stop sign up ahead, and another right turn would put him on a street roughly parallel to Mason Street, where he had begun. And when he got back to the beginning, what did he do? Collect $200 and go round again, admit defeat? Car headlights turned down the street. Lewis stepped behind another tree, waiting for it to pass. This car was moving very slowly, and after a moment, a white spotlight stabbed out from the passenger side and ran flickering along the wrought iron fence. His heart squeezed painfully in his chest. It was a police car checking the cemetery. He pressed himself tight against the tree, the rough bark against his, his cheek, being madly, hoping madly, that it was big enough to shield him. A spotlight ran toward him. Lewis put his head down, trying to shield the white blur of his face. The spotlight reached the tree, disappeared for a moment, and then reappeared on Lewis's right. He slipped around the tree a little. He had a momentary glimpse of the dark bubbles on the cruiser's roof. He waited for the taillights to flare a brighter light, r brighter red for the doors to open. For the spotlight to suddenly turn back on its ball joint, hunting with him like a big white finger. Hey, you. You behind that tree. Come on out where we can see you. And we want to see both hands empty. Come on now. Out now. Please car kept on going. He reached the corner, signaled with sedate propriety, turned left. Lewis collapsed back against the tree, breathing fast, his mouth sour and dry. He supposed they would cruise past his parked Honda, but that didn't really matter. Parking from 6 8 p.m. to 7 a.m. was illegal on Mason Street. There were plenty of other cars parked alongside, along it. Their owners would belong to the scattering apartment buildings on the other side of the street. Lewis found himself glancing up at the tree he had hidden behind. Just above his head, the tree forked. He supposed he could. Make sure. 
Without allowing himself to think about it further, he reached into the fork and pulled himself up, scrambling with his tennis shoes for purchase. Sending a little shower of bark down to the sidewalk, he got a knee up, and a moment later he had one foot planted solidly in the crotch. The elm, the police car should happen to come back, the spotlight would find an extremely peculiar bird in the street. He ought to move quickly. He pulled himself up into a higher branch, one which overhung the very top of the fence. He felt absurdly like the twelve-year-old he supposed he had once been. The tree was not still. It rocked easily, almost soothingly, in the steady wind. Its leaves rustled and murmured. Lewis assessed the situation, and then, before he could get cold feet, he dropped off into space, holding onto the branch with his hands laced together over it. The branch was perhaps a little thicker than a brawny man's forearm. With his sneakers dangling about eight feet above over the sidewalk, he pulled himself hand by hand toward the fence. The branch dipped, but showed no sign of breaking. He was faintly aware of his shadow following along on the cement sidewalk below him in an amorphous black ape shape. The wind chilled his hot armpits, and he found himself shivering in spite of the sweat running down his face and neck. The branch dipped and swayed with his movements. The farther out as he moved, the more pronounced the dip became. His hands and wrists were getting tired now, and he was afraid that his sweaty, greasy palms might slip. He reached the fence. His tennis shoes dangled perhaps a foot below the arrow tips. The tips did not look blunt at all from this angle. They looked very sharp. Sharp or not, he suddenly realized it was not just his balls that were at risk here. If he fell and hit one of those things dead on, his weight would be enough to drive it all the way up into his lungs. The returning cops would find an early and extremely grisly Halloween decoration on the Pleasant View summer fence. Breathing fast, not quite gasping, he groped for the fence points with his feet, needing a moment's rest. For a moment he hung there, his feet moving in an air dance, searching but not finding. Light touched hit him and grew. Oh, Christ, that's a car. There's a car coming. He tried to shuffle. His hands forward with his palms slipped. He inter his interlaced fingers were coming apart. Still groping for purchase, he turned his head to the left, looking under his straining arm. It was a car, but it shot through the intersection of the street without slowing. Lucky if it had. His hands slipped again. He felt bark sift down into, under his hair. One foot found purchase, but now his other... Pant's leg had caught on one of the arrow points, and Christ, he wasn't going to be able to hang on much longer. Desperately, Lewis jerked his leg. The branch dipped. His hand slipped again. There was a mutter of tearing cloth, and then he was standing on two of the arrow points. They dug into the soles of his tennis shoes, and the pressure quickly became painful. But Lewis stood on them anyway. The relief in his hands and arms were greater than the pain in his feet. What a figure I must cut, Lewis thought with dim and Dismal amusement, holding the branch with his left hand, he wiped his right hand across his jacket, then he wiped out the left while he held with the right. He stood on the points for a moment longer and then slipped his hands forward along the branch. It was slim enough for him to be able to lace his fingers together comfortably now. He swung forward like Tarzan, feet leaving the arrow points. The branch dipped alarmingly and he heard an ominous cracking sound he let go, dropping on faith. He landed badly. One knee thudded against the gravestone, sending a lance of pain up his thigh. He rolled over in the grass, holding the knee, lips skinned back in something like a grin. Hoping that he hadn't shattered his kneecap, at last the pain began to fade a little, and he found that he could flex the joint. It would be all right if he kept moving and didn't allow it to stiffen up on him. Maybe. He got to his feet and started to walk along the fence back toward Mason Street and his equipment. His knee was bad at first, and he limped, but the pain smoothed out to a dull ache as he went. There was aspirin in the Honda's first aid kit. He should have remembered to bring that with him. Too late now, he kept an eye out for cars and faded back deeper into the cemetery when one came. On the Mason Street side, which was apt to be better traveled, he kept well back from the fence till he was opposite the Civic. He was about to trot down to the fence and pull his bundle out of the bushes when he heard footfalls on the sidewalk and a woman's low laughter. He sat down behind a large grave marker. It hurt his knee to, too much to squat. He watched a couple walk up the, to the far side of Mason Street. They were walking with their arms about each other's waists and something about their movements from one white pool of light to the next made Lewis think of some old TV show. In a moment, he had it. The Jimmy Durante hour. What would they do if he rose up now, a wavering shadow and the silent cry of the de city of the dead, and cried 
hollowly across them. Good night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever you are. They stopped in the pool of light just beyond his car and embraced, watching them. Lewis felt a kind of sick wonder and self-loathing. Here he was crouching behind a tombstone like a subhuman character in some cheap comic book story, watching lovers in line. Is the line so thin then, he wondered? And that through also, and, and that thought also had a ring of familiarity. So thin you can simply step over with it with this little fuss, muss, and bother. Climb a tree, shooting along a branch, drop into a graveyard, watch lovers, dig holes. That's simple. Is it lunacy? I spent eight years becoming a doctor, but I've become a grave robber in one simple step. What I suppose people would call a ghoul. He cr crammed his fist against his mouth to stop some sound from coming out and felt that for that interior coldness, that sense of disconnection, it was there, and Lewis drew it gratefully around him. When the couple walked on, Lewis watched them with nothing but impatience. They climbed the steps of one of the apartment buildings. The man felt for a key, and a moment later they were inside. The street was silent again, except for the constant beat of the wind, rustling the trees and tumbling sweaty hair over his forehead. Lewis ran down to the fence, bent low, and felt through the brush for his canvas bundle. Here it was, rough under his fingers. He picked it up, listening to the muffled clank from inside. He carried it over to the broad, gravel drive that led in through the gates and paused to orient himself. Straight up here, go left at the fork, no problem. He walked along the edge of the drive, wanting to be able to go farther into the shadow of the elms if there did happen to be a full-time caretaker and if he wanted to be out. He bore left at the fork, approaching Gage's Gage grave now, and suddenly, appallingly, realized he could not remember what his son looked like. He paused, staring off into the rows of graves, the frowning facades of the monuments. Tried to summon him up. Individual features came to him, his blonde hair still so fine and light, his slanting eyes, his small white teeth, a little twist of scar on his chin from the time he had fallen down the back steps of the place in Chicago. He could see those things, but could not integrate them into a coherent whole. He saw Gage running toward the road, running toward his appointment with the Orinco truck. But Gage's face was turned away. He tried to summon up Gage as he had been in his crib on the night of the kite-flying day and could see only darkness in his mind's eye. Gage, where are you? Have you ever thought, Lewis, that you may not be doing your son any good service? Perhaps he's happy where he is. Maybe all of that isn't the bullshit you always thought it was. Maybe he's with the angels. Maybe he's just sleeping. And if he's sleeping, do you really know what it is? You might wake it up. Wake up. Oh, Gage, where are you? I want you home with us. But was he really controlling his own actions? Why couldn't he summon up Gage's face? And why was he going against everyone's warning? Judd's, the dream of Pascal, the trepidation of his own troubled heart. He thought of the grave markers in the pet cemetery. Those rude circles spiraling down into the mystery, and then the coldness came over him again, and why was he standing there, trying to summon up Gage's face anyway? He would be seeing it soon enough. The headstone was here now. It read simply Gage William Creed, followed by the two dates. Someone had been there today to pay his or her respects. He saw there was fresh flowers. Who would that have been, Missy Dandridge? His heart beat heavily but slowly in his chest. This was it, then. If he was going to do it, he had better start. There was only so much night ahead, and then the day would come. Lewis glanced into his heart. One final time saw that, yes, he did intend to go ahead with this. He nodded his head almost imperceptibly and finished fished for his pocket knife. He had cinched his bundle with scotch strapping tape, and now he cut it. He unrolled the tarp at the head of uh, Gage's grave like a bedroll and then arranged items in exactly the same way he would have arranged instruments to suture a cutter to perform a small... In, uh, in office operation, here was the flashlight with its lens belted as a hardware store clerk had suggested. The felt was also secured with strapping tape. He had made a small circle in the middle by placing a penny on the felt and cutting around it with a scalpel. Here was the short handle pick, which he should not have to use. He had brought it only as a contingency. He would have no sealed cap to deal with, and he shouldn't run into any rocks in a newly filled grave. Here was the shovel, the spade, the length of rope, the work gloves. He put the gloves on, grabbed the spade, and started. The ground was soft, the digging easy, the grave shape was well defined. Dirt he was throwing out 
softer than the earth at the verge. His mind made a kind of automatic comparison between the ease of this dig and the rocky, unforgiving ground of the place where, if all went well, he would be reburying his son later on this night. Up there he would need the pick, but then he'd try to stop thinking altogether. It only got in the way. He threw the dirt on the ground and left the grave, working into a steady rhythm that only became more difficult to maintain as the hole deepened. He stepped into the grave, smelling that dank aroma of fresh dirt, a smell he remembered from his summer's uncle Carl, Digger, he thought, and stopped to wipe, to wipe. Sweat from his brow, Uncle Carl had told him that was the nickname for every graveyard sexton in America. The friends called him Digger. He started in again. He stopped only once more, and that was to check his watch. It's twenty minutes past twelve. He felt time slipping through his fist like something that had been greased. Forty minutes later, the spade gritted across something, and Lewis's teeth came down on his li upper lip, hard enough to bring blood. He got the flashlight and shone it again. Here was more than dirt, and scrawled it across in a diagonal slash, a grayish silver line. It was the top of the grave liner. Lewis got most of the dirt off, but he was wary of making too much noise. Nothing was much louder than a shovel scraping across concrete in the dead of night. He climbed into the grave and got the rope. This he threaded through the iron rings on one half of the segmented grave liner top. He got out of the grave again, spread out the tarpaulin, lay down on it, and grasped the ends of the rope. Lewis, I think this is it. Your last chance. You are right. It's my last chance. I'll be damned. And I'm damned while taking it. He, he, would, he wound the ends of the rope round his hands and pulled. The square of concrete came up easily, gritting on the pivot end. It stood neatly upright over a square of blackness, now a vertical tombstone instead of a for horizontal grave cover. Lewis pulled the rope out of the rings and tossed it aside. He wouldn't need it for the other half. He could stand on the sides of the grave line and pull it up. He got down into the grave again, moving carefully, not wanting to overturn the cement slab. He had already pulled up and mashed his toes and break the damn thing, which was quite thin. Pebbles rattled down into the hole, and he heard several of them chip hollowly off Gage's coffin. Bending, he grasped the other half of the grave liner top and pulled upward. As he did so, he felt something squelch coldly under his fingers. When he had the second half of the top standing on end, he looked down at his hand and saw a fat earthworm wriggling feebly there. With a choked cry of disgust, Lewis wiped off the earthen sidewall of his son's grave. Then he shone his flashlight downward. Here was the coffin in, last seen resting on chrome runners on over the grave at the funeral service surrounded by that ghastly green astroturf. This was a safety deposit box in which he was supposed to bury all his hopes for his son. Fury, clean and white, hot, the antithesis of his former coldness rose up in him. Idiotic, the answer was no. Lewis groped for the spade and found it. He raised it over his shoulder and brought it down on the co coffin's latch once, twice, third time, and fourth. His lips were drawn back in a furious grimace. Going to break you out, Gage. See if I don't. Latch had splintered on, splintered on the first stroke, and probably no more were necessary, but he went on, not wanting just to open the coffin, but to hurt it. Some kind of sanity finally returned, and he stopped with the spade, rest, raised for another blow. The bl blade was bent and scratched. He tossed it aside and scrambled out of the grave on logs, legs that felt weak and rubbery. He felt sick to his stomach, and the anger had gone as quickly as it had come. In its place, the coldness flooded back in. And never in his life had his mind felt so alone and disconnected. He felt like an astronaut who had floated away from his ship during an EVA. And now only in drifts and great blackness, breathing on borrowed time, did Bill Baderman feel like this, he wondered. He lay on the ground on his back this time, waiting to see if he was under control and ready to proceed. When the rubbery feeling had left his legs, he sat up and slipped back down into the rave. He shone the flashlight under the lash and saw it was just, not just broken, but demolished. He had swung the spade in a blind fury, but every blow he had struck had gone directly there, bullseye, as if guided. The wood rounded it splintered. Lewis slipped the flashlight into his armpit. He squatted down slightly. His hands groped like the hands of a catcher in a troop. Circus flyers, waiting to perform his part in a mortal docking. He found the groove in the lid, and he slipped his fingers into it. He paused for a moment. One could not rightly call it a hesitation, and then he opened his son's coffin. And we're going to stop there, chapter, at the end of chapter 49. Next video, we are going to work on chapter, start working on chapter.
50 and get into the more meat where gauge comes back. But if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. See you next time.